we were trying to generalize the stability criteria when we have more than two poles and of course to do it in a way that is easy in factors. Okay. <laughs> so we know that evaluating the sinusoidal steady state response or Bode plot is easier than uh, playing around with polynomials, finding poles and so on. Okay. There are two reasons. One is of course it's more difficult to play around with polynomials. The other one is we also want a measure of the margin, okay, not just that it is stable, right. So that's why what we do is for the second order case we do have the results. We have the damping factor which tells you how stable it is, okay, in some sense, right, by quantifying the amount of ringing that will be there in the natural response of the step response, you get this, right. So what we do is we look at the body plot of the second order system for different damping factors. We have some intuition based on what the loop gain should be or in particular what it should not be. It should not be minus one for sure, right, because that will lead to instability. So we will look at the second order case and look at how far it is from minus one in some sense for different damping factors and use similar criteria for higher order systems, okay. So that's what, as far as we go here. These things can be more rigorously done, okay. If you uh, have done like rows on complex theory, we can go into something called the Nyquist criterion from which all these things can be derived. Nyquist criterion also relates to a complex plot of the loop gain. You plot the imaginary part of the loop gain versus the real part of the loop gain. It will do something, it will have some funny shape. And it turns out that from that you can tell if the closed loop system has poles in the right half plane, how many poles will be there and how far it is away from uh, the dangerous point of minus 1, etc. Okay. We won't go into that. We will use the simpler uh, criterion, but I will also tell you when it applies exactly and when you might have to be little careful. Okay. So, any questions about any of the discussions yesterday? Just to summarize, for a second order case, the loop gain is the DC loop gain and it has two poles, okay. And assuming everything is designed as they should be, P1 will be at a low frequency and P2 could be at a much higher frequency than the unity loop gain frequency. The unity loop gain frequency, if the body plot looks like this, if P2 is far away, is that. Okay. This is the magnitude of the loop gain. This is the angle of the loop gain. The angle of the loop gain, of course, in this case, it goes from 0 to minus 90, stays that way over a very wide uh, frequency range and then goes to minus 135 at E2 and eventually to minus 180, okay. It never quite reaches minus 180 which is another way of uh, saying that the second order system is unconditionally stable, right, because L can never be exactly minus 1, okay. So, it will always have some, it can go close to minus 1 perhaps but not that. So, when it goes close to minus 1, that is when you have under damp response, okay. So, now I identified uh, L of minus 1 which means that at the unity loop gain frequency, I mark phase of pi, then I look at how far away we are from that, okay. And again, instead of looking at the distance between L and minus 1, an even simpler thing is to simply look at at the unity loop gain frequency, how far was the phase is away from minus 180, okay. So, these things can be misleading sometimes, okay. What you are really interested in is the minimum value of minimum magnitude of 1 plus L, okay, as frequency changes. If this becomes very small, that means that L is getting very close to minus 1. But again, for convenience, we will simply look at the phase criteria. Okay. So now this difference 
this is what is called the phase margin okay and if uh, the plot is the way i have drawn it here that is p2 is well beyond the unity loop gain frequency what is the phase margin going to be huh minus pi by 2 yeah it is 90 degrees okay that's typically the best thing that you can get okay because there will always be one pole at a low frequency by the way yesterday i kept asking you to use the approximation a not by k much more than one okay where does that come into picture essentially that means that this p1 is much lower than the unity loop gain frequency so at the unity loop gain frequency the phase lag due to p1 is 90 degrees okay so at the unity loop gain frequency what's the phase lag due to p1 it is tan inverse <coughs> omega u loop divided by p1 but if the argument is much more than one the inverse tangent can be approximated to 90 degrees so that's a simplification so you can assume that because of this pole the phase lag there is 90 degrees okay so that again further simplifies the calculation and this is anyway a good approximation because you do want this a not by k to be much more than 1 okay this is this part fine now what are the good values of uh, zeta we had identified for the second order for critical damping zeta equals 1 so did you calculate the phase margin what is it 70 76 degrees i think right okay and for zeta equals uh, half how much 45 okay for zeta equals half the bodes plot will look like this and where is the second pole at omega u loop okay so we will draw the bodes plot like that And then say that the phase margin is 45 degree. This is for zeta equals half. Okay. Now this itself is an approximation. Where is the approximation here? <coughs> huh? Yeah. So I think that's what you said. Actually, this plot will curve like that, right? It will be under that one. because the second pole is right on top of what we identified as so basically we said the second pole is equal to a not by k times p1 if indeed that's the case where it cuts unity will be slightly less than that okay so this phase margin criterion applies to where the loop gain actually cuts unity not the approximated bode value but for hand calculations we'll use that okay unless otherwise specified we can use that actually you have to look at where model equals 1 and then evaluate the phase there that's what matters because it's the actual value of the loop gain being minus 1 that is dangerous right in the bode approximation we approximate it with straight line segments but we do know that this goes below that so the actual value of omega u loop is less than this okay this approximation holds for a first order case and also for higher orders when the uh, other poles are well beyond the well beyond this value okay you understand so we make many approximations to make calculations simpler <coughs> right because uh, well especially while doing hand analysis there is not always much point going through reams of algebra which don't give you much insight at the same time you should know when you are do when you are using which approximation and why okay the range of validity of approximation Is it okay? So clearly, I mean, if the second pole were somewhere here, where it cuts unity is definitely not a not by k times p1. Okay. Of course, of course, we don't encounter this very often because this is a very bad case anyway. What will be the phase margin here? Hmm? the phase will be close to minus pi by 2 so phase margin will be close to zero right so anyway uh, we are not interested in that case as far as negative feedback amplifier sir concern so we don't see that but anyway in any case not only this you have to be aware of uh, what approximations are being made and when it is valid etc and just for completeness for zeta equals uh, 1 over square root 2 what's the phase margin 60 3 3 okay 
So if you look at it for reasonable values of for damping factor, which we want to be let's say between half and one, <coughs> the break margin would be between let's say 45 and 75 degrees, 76 degrees. Okay. Now for any higher order system, we essentially make the Bode plot look like this, right? So there will be one pole at very low frequency, and then uh, there will be a 20 dB per decade roll off. There can be now more than one pole, or maybe even a zero. But the cumulative effect of all of that at the unity loop gain frequency should be like this, okay? Meaning the phase margin should be, let's say, between 45 and 75 degrees, okay? Now, in many places, you see 60 degrees phase margin, is, this is where it comes from. But the phase margin is not some sacred number. Like I said, what margin you want to have depends on uh, what you expect to vary and how you, how much you want your safety factor to be, etc. okay? There are uh, things that uh, we have designed where the phase margin is about 30 degrees. But typically, probably not lower than that, okay? So, if from the context, you can figure out exactly what the phase margin should be, that's fine. Otherwise, I mean, uh, without any other information, you can kind of expect that the phase margin in any reasonably designed negative feedback system should be around 60 degrees plus minus one, okay? Any questions? So, for higher order systems, let's take... The loop gain would be, I will still continue to assume that the loop gain has only poles. Again, this is not even true, it can have zeros as well. But let me go with this. Okay, let's say there are three poles. So, what do we do? magnitude and phase of the loop gain. What is the DC value of the loop gain? A naught by K. Okay. And then this P1 must be at a low frequency. If it was just a first order system, the loop gain would have looked like that and the phase would have looked like that. What is the phase margin if the loop gain is first order? Huh? 5 by 2. Okay, so that's about the best phase margin that you can get in practice. Now, for a higher order system, where do we want P2 and P3 to be? Where will they be? Where will they be? Clearly after the unity loop gain frequency. Because if they are at the unity loop gain frequency, then they will each contribute uh, 45 degrees of phase. So that means that the phase margin will be worse than 45 degrees. Okay, so wherever they are, they have to be beyond this. So, let's say P2 is here and P3 is there and so on, okay? So, then the phase plot, what happens is it will look like that and then it will start falling and it will fall, it will fall. What is the asymptotic value as uh, at very high frequencies? Minus? 3 pi by 2 or minus 270 degrees. Okay. So, in this case, the phase margin is whatever it is at omega you loop, this distance. Okay. Now, in a higher order case, you can see, like let's say you had placed the pole somewhere here. Uh, let's say around the unity loop gain frequency, it is possible that the phase will do something like this, it will start decaying here and then cut that minus 180 over there, L becomes minus 1 and then it is unstable, okay? So, for a higher order systems, instability is possible, that is L can be exactly minus 1 and this is what you have found. You did that for when the three poles were identical, okay? Now, the three poles are not identical, but at least from the picture you can imagine, right? With three poles, the phase can be exactly minus uh, 180 degrees and you can adjust the value of A naught by K, that is you raise the magnitude plot 
so that when the phase is 180, magnitude is exactly minus 1. Is this okay? So this is how essentially we have generalized from the second order case to higher orders and now of course we are not limited to three poles, we can have as many as we want. All of them have to be well beyond the unity loop gain frequency. In fact, the more of them you have, the further away they have to be because each one will contribute a little bit of phase lag at the unity loop gain frequency and the combined effect of all those phase lags should be less than let us say 30 degrees. If you want 60 degrees of phase margin. P1 always contributes 90 degrees, right? And each of the other poles contributes tan inverse omega u loop by pk. You can have as many as you want, k of 2, 3, 4, how many ever. But the sum of all those contributions should be less than 30 degrees, okay? So that you are 60 degrees away from minus 180, okay? Any questions about the definition of phase margin and how we generalized it. <laughs> so, if you evaluate the step response, you will see that it will do something. Okay. So, if the phase margin is uh, very close to 0 degrees, it means that the closed loop poles that is the roots of 1 over 1 plus L, the denominator of that will have come very close to the imaginary axis, okay. So, you have poles with very low damping factor in the closed loop or poles with very high quality factor and then that will give you a lot of ringing, that is the problem. <coughs> Essentially, if uh, you can see that the closed loop gain of any negative feedback system, closed loop transfer function will be something times 1 by 1 plus L, okay. This is what we saw yesterday, right? It is either G by 1 plus G H or 1 by 1 plus G H and so on. This number depends on where you apply the, the, the free multiplier here, depends on where you apply the input and output. But the effect of negative feedback can be sort of summarized in this. Okay, it gives you a 1 over 1 plus L multiplying everything. Now, you can see that minimum value of 1 plus L, okay. What does that signify? That is basically the same as, uh, I mean that is related to the maximum value of 1 by 1 plus L, okay. Maybe I should not write it like this, yeah. Maybe let me write it as L by 1 plus L, that is how it is, right. So that this number is close to 1 when uh, L is very large and then it will become dependent on the loop gain when L is very small. So we want things to be independent of the loop gain, right, independent of the actual active components that generate the loop gain. So that is why it is L by 1 plus L. So now if uh, minimum value of 1 plus L is very small, then what happens is this number here, it would have started from 1, but 1, one, one plus L, the magnitude of that becomes very small, it will go up, okay in the frequency domain and it will come down. So, there will be peaking in the frequency response, okay, which also signifies ringing in the time domain. Because at this frequency, it has a large gain. So, it kind of has a preference for that frequency, right. So, that is why it will, it will ring at that frequency. That is how you can interpret the frequency domain picture where you, I mean, for small values of damping factor, we saw that the magnitude goes up well above 1. For damping factor equal to 0, it will go all the way to infinity and it will keep oscillating, okay. So, that is what happens with very poor phase margin, it will keep on ringing. The other risk with very poor phase margin is you design it for some nominal conditions and you have some idea of how much they will vary. So, you have to make sure that under all those conditions, the phase margin is small. So, that is why you have the margin. Now, let us say the conditions change like a little bit beyond what you expected and it becomes unstable, then you have a big problem, okay. So, that is why you need a more reasonable margin then. You do not want to be operating with a phase margin of 1 degree, right. I mean then you blow on the circuit and you start oscillating, so that is not good. <coughs> not low phase margin, there is application for zero phase margin when you want an oscillator, right, because then you want an oscillation, sustained oscillation. 
But if you want an amplifier, this is not a good thing because anytime the input changes, there will be a lot of ringing or uh, you have a uh, lot of amplification. Also, amplifiers amplify not only signal, but any noise that is at the input. So, a noise at that frequency will be amplified by a substantial amount. So, it's not good. For a negative feedback amplifier, you don't want that kind of phase monitor. Okay, 30 degrees may be okay, but not 1 degree. Any other questions? Now, of course, we said uh, L being minus 1 is dangerous. It will basically indicates instability. Now, let's say what happens when uh, you have poles at lower frequency and the phase does something like this. Let's say the unity loop gain frequency is still here, but the phase is more negative than minus 180. Is it stable or unstable? The unity loop gain frequency, at the unity loop gain frequency, the phase is, phase lag is more than 5. What do you think? Is it stable or unstable? Yes. Huh? I mean, these two words sound almost the same, so I can't hear what you're saying. How many words for stable? Unstable? Okay. It turns out that when L of S has no zeros, okay, that is of the type I have given here. You can have how many ever poles you want, but it has no zeros. Then, if angle of L is less than minus 5, that is more negative than minus 180 degrees, at omega u loop, the system is unstable. This is guaranteed. Okay. L, I mean, in this case, there is no frequency at which L equals minus 1. But when L, the magnitude of L becomes 1, then if the phase angle is more than minus 5, it turns out that it is unstable. Okay. So, this again you can get from uh, the Nyquist criterion, which uh, we can't discuss in this course. Okay. So, what, is, what distinguishes uh, L when it has no zeros and when it has zeros, I mean, what can you say about the border plot? Imagine a case where the loop gain has no zeros at all, it has only poles and then uh, when it does have zeros and poles, what is the... What's that? No. Which pole is slope? Huh? Yeah, first of all, uh, in any real system, you won't have more zeros than poles. Why is that? Basically, it means infinite gain at uh, infinite frequency, right? So, that's why you can't have that. So, every natural system is low pass at some frequency, beyond some frequency, it will stop responding. Okay? So, that you can kind of imagine. If you go on changing things rapidly, at some point, like any system will stop responding. So, every system will, if you model it with poles and zeros, will have more poles than zeros. Okay? Now, if you don't have uh, zeros, the point is that the phase response will be monotonic. Right? It starts from zero phase angle. Assuming the, at uh, DC, you have a positive real number. Then the phase goes on decreasing and it will continuously go on decreasing. But if you do have zeros, it can turn back. Okay, so that's the distinguishing case. So when it turns back, you can have cases where L is more negative than minus 1. Okay, so L could be minus 2 at some frequency, but it is still stable. But when uh, it is monotonically reducing, that's not, that's not going to happen. Okay. So again, to understand these things well, you need some basics of control engineering, which unfortunately you don't have now. But hopefully you will remember enough of this next semester to associate this with the criteria and the criteria they teach you in control engineering. Okay. Another way to think about it is like uh, you plotted the locus of the poles, right? For uh, in one of the tutorial problems, I mean, how the poles changed with what? A exactly. So. Essentially, A naught by K. Okay? So, that's what is of interest. Right? If you look at a 
So let let me imagine uh, the exactly the same system. The DC loop gain is a naught by k, and then I have a number of uh, poles s by p1, 1 plus s by p2, and so on. Okay, 1 plus s by p3, etc. Okay. Now I will change only a naught by k. Sorry, this is the magnitude, and this is the angle. If I change only a naught by k, what can I say about the phase plot? It will be the same. It has got nothing to do with a naught by k, right? So let me say that p1 is there. P2 is over there and P3 is there and so on. Okay, so what happens is the phase starts from uh, zero, will be minus 90, something like this, and here it will be below 180 degrees, and then eventually go up to minus 3 pi by 2. Okay. Now let's start with a very small value of a naught by k. What does it mean? The plot will look like this, the magnitude plot. The magnitude plot does depend on a naught by k, obviously. So, it will have breakpoints at P2 and P3. Okay. What is the phase margin here? Is it stable or unstable? Huh? Stable. Why? Obviously, the unity loop gain frequency is very low. And then, the phase there is just about pi by 2. Okay, so clearly in this case, uh, the system is stable. They are quite a bit away from uh, this 180 degrees. Okay, this means that the closed loop system has poles in the left half plane. Okay, is this clear? We are looking at, I mean, again, don't get confused. We have poles of the loop gain and poles of the closed loop transfer function. It's the poles of the closed loop transfer function that we want to be in the left half plane. Okay, but we use the poles of the loop gain to evaluate what happens to stability. So now I increase the uh, DC loop gain a naught by k. What happens? This simply gets lifted up, right? Okay, and then uh, for even higher loop gain, it will do that. The breakpoints will be at the same frequencies, but so what is changing here? The unity loop gain frequency. Okay. So now, if you if you plot the locus of the roots as you change a0 by k what happens is for very small values of a0 by k the poles will be in the left half plane and at some point they will cross they will be on the imaginary axis where is that when it so happens that at uh, the unity loop gain frequency the phase is exactly minus 1 okay and after that they will go into the right half plane and they will never come back Okay, so this is what happens for an all pole system because both the magnitude and phase are monotonic, right? Okay, so the phase is monotonically falling, so that's why once it crosses minus pi, it never comes back. Okay, but it turns out again, we won't deal with this now. But uh, if the phase does something funny like this, so let's say it can uh, go down to large values and come back, then this can happen, okay, and then it does that, right? So then clearly. Even for a small DC loop gain, there could be some place where uh, the gain is more negative than minus 1. But because of this non monotonic nature, it turns out that it just comes back here. Okay. So, what matters is what happens when it is kind of uh, falling off at high frequencies. Okay. So, evaluate the phase margin from there. So, we will, I mean, if there is time, we will discuss the case with zeros. Right. Now, here the zeros are at very low frequency. Okay. Now we can have zeros at high frequencies, that's not a problem. I mean, for instance, in this case, I can have 1 plus s by z1, where z1 is also at a high frequency. So what will happen is that this will uh, do something like that. And then in that case, there is no problem. 
Okay, that means I mean even in that case, what, what I when I say no problem, what I meant is the, regarding the criteria. So the same thing will apply. Okay. <coughs> any questions about any of this? So if you have a higher order system and you find that the phase margin is either zero or negative, how will you stabilize it now? What do you do? What do you have to do? Basically, you have to move one of the poles to a lower frequency. Okay. I mean, hopefully, you don't have to introduce new poles. The existing poles can be moved to a lower frequency. In circuit terms, how might you do this? How would you do this? So, let's say I have this. Uh, let me even take a second order case. It doesn't matter. Second order case can have poor phase margin, though never negative. So, let me say this is my op amp. Okay. And I will assume that there is an ideal buffer. This is GM1 times VE. This is RO1, CT1, GM2 times VO1, RO2, CT2. Okay. When I find that the phase margin of this, I use this in, uh, this is my op amp, right? And I use this in my amplifier. Maybe this is just a unity gain amplifier. Okay. And I find that the phase margin is 1 degree. How do I fix this? What should I do? Huh? I mean, it's okay to say that uh, algebraically I have to move one of the ports to a lower frequency. But what should I do in a circuit? Huh? That's Karthik, what do I do? Yeah, I mean, where are the poles of the system? The poles of the loop gain, where are they? 1 by? Take 1 by RC, I mean, there are some subscripts, please. R what, C what? R01, CP1, and? 1 by R2 CP2. So how do I, how do you move anything to a low frequency? You increase one of the capacitor values. Okay. So let's say I take CP1 and how do I increase it? I connect another capacitor here and that's all, right? I have to adjust the, that value to be sufficiently large so that basically A0 by K times that pole will be lower than the other pole. Okay. The tutorial has some problem like this, which you have to solve. But you understand, any system can be stabilized by moving one of the poles to a very low frequency. Okay? So, this kind of uh, uh, stabilization technique, by the way, we said the, the, the stable system looks like this. Okay? That is where P1 is at a very low frequency and uh, other poles are at high frequencies. Okay? So, if you start with a case where all poles are comparable, you will have very poor phase margin or maybe even a negative phase margin. So, you have to fix that by making one of the poles much lower than the others. Okay? And also, there is some, uh, uh, there are some good choices and bad choices. So, let's say I have two poles. So, let's say the pole here was at uh, 10 kilo radians per second. And the pole here is at 25 kilo radians per second. Okay. So, which one will you move? The one that is already lower. Why? Easier? Easier? No, I mean, I can always have a bigger capacitor, right? Is that the only reason? Why? No, no, that's correct. I can, so I can, see, what do I want it to be? So, let's say A0 by K is 1000. Okay. So, that means that I want A0 by K times one of the poles to be equal to one fourth of the other pole. So, let's say we are talking about damping factor of 1. Okay? Yeah, that's right. So, for instance, so A0 by K is 1000. So, let's say I decrease this. What should I decrease it to? 
if i if i decrease this one where should be the unity loop gain frequency huh? what is the value i just told you the condition right i want damping factor 1 25 by 4 6.25 okay so i want omega u loop to be 6.25 kilo radians per second so i want p1 to be how much this divided by 1000 so 6.25 radians per second okay so this will give me a damping factor of 1 so let's say instead i do this or maybe one of you does that so then what do i want where do i want the unity loop gain frequency to be huh it's basically the 1/4 of the other one so i want 2.5 kilo radians per second so that means that this we should move from 25 to how much 2.5 radians per second now the capacitor value that you have to put in the two cases will be different but let's not worry about it i mean is there something else to choose here bandwidth yeah what about it obviously right the bandwidth is basically the unity loop gain frequency isn't it so if you lower the smaller one you will end up with a higher bandwidth so that's just a wise thing to do i mean in this case you would have a bandwidth of 6.25 kilo radians per second in other case 2.5 okay so you are unnecessarily shooting yourself in the foot right so this kind of uh, system where you have one pole at a low frequency right and one pole at low frequencies and that dominates all the action up to the unity loop gain frequency okay and beyond the unity loop gain frequency you can have poles and zeros i just said uh, poles but you can also have zeros the cumulative effect of all the poles and zeros should be such that the phase margin is let's say 60 degrees now a zero will give you phase lead actually it will help you stabilize the system right and a pole will give you phase lag the more poles you have the more the tendency towards instability whereas the more zeros you have they can stabilize it so sometimes there is also a technique that you can introduce a zero somewhere here so that the phase it's kind of falling down and then goes back up okay by the and so this kind of system this is known as a dominant pole system so this basically says that there is one dominant pole which governs the roll off of the loop gain up to the unity loop gain frequency okay and here p1 is the dominant pole and this business of uh, let's say you have a number of poles it's not uh, stable enough for you you have to move one of the poles to a very low frequency so that this condition is satisfied that's known as dominant pole frequency compensation the term can be a little weird but the frequency compensation essentially refers to stabilization of the negative feedback system with sufficient phase margin okay so that's known as dominant pole frequency compensation okay now this is not the only way to do it there are systems which are stable which will have which can have additional poles and zeros before the unity loop gain frequency okay so you can have things like this for instance you can start off with minus 60 db per decade and then you can have two zeros so that it becomes minus 20 and you have stable systems like that so these are not dominant pole systems okay now initially at least we will look at only the dominant pole systems again if we get time we'll get to the other systems which can have multiple zeros and poles before the unity loop gain frequency so in a dominant pole system all the other things here these are called non dominant poles and zeros okay write it into the general notation you know what it means right so you can have a number of poles and zero okay a dominant pole system means that 
P1 is much less than uh, all the others PK and DK. Okay. And mainly, I mean, more importantly, A0 by K times P1 is actually smaller than all the other PKs and DKs. Okay. You know, if you, once you understand the picture, once you have that mental board board, right, where it uh, has this plant at A0 by K, falls off at 20 degrees per decade, starting from P1, and it crosses unity, the location falls below unity. Only after that you have other poles and zeros. So that is a stable system. So that is the dominant pole system. So that's what I am showing here. And this is the dominant pole. And these are what are known as non-dominant poles and zeros. Okay. Essentially, what we have done is, I mean, some kind of cheating or a lame solution, but it works very well. When we had only this, a first order system, things were working very well, right? We have made this also look roughly like that. Okay, because we have all these extra terms, but they come into picture only after loop gain falls to some insignificant magnitude. Is this okay? And in such a case, or in any case, you use the phase margin criterion. So, phase margin is the stability criterion. Okay. Any questions on any of this? So, the business of, let's say you start with some values of uh, P1, P2, etc. Business of making one of the poles like much lower than the others. So, that the stability criterion is satisfied. That's known as dominant pole frequency component. Okay. And you will see this in the lab also. The circuit will be doing something funny. Okay. You can put your finger on some node and then suddenly the oscilloscope picture cleans up. Because when you put your finger there, the capacitance of that node increases. And this can be done at any node. Okay. Let's say you are not concerned with optimization. For instance, like I showed you this because one of them is suboptimal. Right. But if you only want it to stabilize, it doesn't matter. You can always find any node in the signal path, you can hang a large enough capacitor and it will become stable. It may be useless because it becomes very slow, bandwidth may be very small and so on. But uh, many times you can see the puzzling stuff when you are fiddling around with the wires, the oscilloscope display may be clean and then the moment you take off your hand, it will go bad. Okay, that's because the system is stable when you have your finger on it and then it's not. Okay. So, this kind of thing happens quite a lot in the lab and then of course it gets like more and more messy to debug the more messy your wiring is and so on. This also tells you why you shouldn't have long wires like running all over the place, right? They have a lot more parasitic uh, capacitances and who knows what will happen. Okay. So it should, all the circuits should be as compact as possible. So physically the smaller the circuit, the smaller the parasitic component will be. I mean, you just have like very small uh, area, then the parasitic capacitor also will be very small. Okay. So that's why when you go to higher and higher frequencies, the layout has to be very compact, the physical layout. Okay. So that's extremely important. Any other questions about this? Yeah, that we will see. Now, for this particular uh, example, which is actually, it turns out is a good model of an open. Okay. Except for some technical reasons, because of the way the transistor is, these things will be pointing downwards, but if both are pointing downwards, nothing changes, right? The gain from there to there is still positive, okay? So, V01 will be minus GM1 times V times R01 divided by something. So, except and you get another minus sign, okay? Now, it turns out in this case, uh, the way I showed, increasing one of the capacitors is like increase, decreasing one of the poles. But there is actually a much better technique which we will discuss uh, next. It turns out that you can decrease one of the poles and increase the other pole. Okay. So that is even better, right? So right now what we are doing is keeping one of them fixed and moving this backwards. But better thing is to move them this way. That is better. Now you can also introduce zeros. Typically what happens is you cannot introduce a zero without affecting the frequency of some pole that is already there. Or without introducing a new pole. 
Okay. So this is some fundamental thing. It is related to the fact that uh, you can't have more zeros than this. Okay. Because I mean, algebraically, if I could simply introduce like one more pole, let's say Z M, and I make Z M equals P K, it will completely cancel out the pole. Okay, in principle, I can cancel out the effect of all the poles, but that's not possible. What happens is, when you introduce a zero, some of the pole frequencies will change, or you will introduce yet another pole. Okay, so you know, introducing zeros is a very legitimate technique of uh, frequency computation, which is used quite often. But it is more complicated in that it will always introduce another pole, and you have to make sure that the new pole that you are introducing is not making things worse. Okay, but it is used. Any other questions? Oh, okay. This is you are talking about some practical aspect of breadboard and so on. But I mean, I am talking about a general principle. Obviously, you shouldn't have shorts. Then the subject won't work at all. Should make it compact without making shorts. In a way, that's a limitation of technology. That is how closely you can get wires without reliability. Uh, I mean, uh, without having uh, unreliability. Like this, short. I mean, this is not in particular to the breadboard. You make it as compact as possible. Anything else? Now, this discussion should also give you some insight into. Why it is bad to have uh, in the loop gain close to each other? Okay. For the third order case, for instance, you took three identical poles and instability set in. Instability set in like now when uh, the loop gain was uh, just uh, eight. Okay. So, which one do you think is bad for uh, stability when the poles are kind of uh, distributed far apart or when uh, they are close to each other? Why? I mean, based on the criteria we just discussed. <coughs> if you look at the board plot of a single pole system, right? This is the pole frequency. Now, before the pole frequency, the magnitude is constant, and after that, it rolls off. Okay. And if you look at the phase, the phase changes both before and after. The total phase changes y by two. I mean, you can say that half of the phase change happens before and half of it after. Okay. Now, if you have multiple poles on top of each other or very close to each other, what happens is the gain will still remain the same. Before the pole frequency, right? Roughly speaking, in the Bode's watch sense. So let's say you have now three poles. But the phase would have changed a lot more. Right? So you can see now what did we want for stability? We wanted all the non dominant poles and zeros to be beyond the unity looking frequency. But if you have poles close to each other, there is no room for the magnitude to drop, right? The magnitude drops only after the pole frequency. Whereas the phase changes rapidly even before the pole frequency. So if you have multiple poles, even before the pole, the phase would have dropped to a large value before the magnitude starts dropping. Okay? So that's why you can't, I mean, that's why it is very bad for instability. Now you can see the magnitude is still very high, whereas the pole would have gone to minus pi and then it will give you instability. Okay? okay Ah, that, that is fine. So, you basically you are saying that the dominant pole dominates the roll off, right? Essentially, you let the magnitude fall off because of the dominant pole and after that you introduce an extra phase shift. That's what we want to do, okay? So, when you have multiple poles on top of each other, I meant including the, including P1, okay? So, which is why you find that uh, when you had three poles, right, on top of each other, stability criterion, you can find the, for a loop gain of 8, it was unstable. Now you can do that. The algebra is very simple. You assume identical poles or even higher order. That is, let's say you assume like uh, four or five identical poles and then evaluate exactly the same thing. You will find that even for smaller values of loop gain, it becomes unstable. Okay. The reason is 
with more and more poles the phase changes rapidly before the magnitude starts dropping and essentially that is bad for stability okay okay please think about these things we will uh, look at the more sophisticated uh, stabilization technique not just hanging a capacitor at one of the nodes in the next class